Hello everyone, um, I'm going to uh, give you a brief talk about um, the UK Constitution, about uh, its um, sources and about the characteristics of the British Constitution. Um, and I know there's some people who say it doesn't exist, they say it's unwritten, because I know it is written, it's just uncodified, it's not drawn together in a single document, but um, it's um, very unclear what it is, w which documents form part of the UK Constitution and says who. That, that People say it's Erskine May, which is a 19th century book about parliamentary procedure, but there's no law passed to say that Erskine May forms part of it. Um, people say that Magna Carta is part of it and so on. I don't know who disputes that, even though 60 of Magna Carta 63 clauses have been either um, abolished or else reformulated. But back to the uh, British Constitution. And notice I'm talking about the Constitution of the whole of the United Kingdom, not just about England or England and Wales. Um, so, uh, constitutional law these days is supposed to contain human rights, a concept which didn't exist in the Western world till 1789, and wasn't, wasn't widely used until the mid-20th century. And of course there's the European Convention on Human Rights, which is uh, drawn up in 1948, uh, ratified in 1950, but only um, transposed into the UK's domestic law um, in 1998 with the Human Rights Act, which only took effect in the year 2000. And almost immediately there were legal challenges to various things because of the, uh, Europe, the Human Rights Act. So um, uh, public authorities are not uh, allowed to act in a way which is incompatible with the Human Rights Act. If they do, then courts sometimes issue declarations of incompatibility, but leave it up to legislatures to resolve the situation. And um, try and make sure that uh, public authorities, parliament or other legislatures or the police or a local education authority and so forth, um, act in, in, in accordance with the European Convention on Human Rights Act. There could be huge judicial review. There could be judicial review of other um, ways public bodies are acting. Not no, no one's claiming this is um, in conflict with um, the uh, Human Rights Act. For instance, should there be a third uh, third runway at Heathrow, for, for reasons I shan't go into, a court decided, no, that's illegal, you can't do that. So just because public authority does something, the Prime Minister, a Cabinet Minister, uh, local council, the police or whatever, the NHS, that doesn't prove it's legal, it gets subject to judicial review. Usually the courts decide, no, the public authority has acted lawfully, but it's not surprising, you don't expect them to be acting unlawfully an awful lot. So um, anyway, so what are the, some of the uh, core constitutional principles? There's a separation of powers, the three branches of government, the executive, the judiciary, and the uh, legislature, or the executive branch, the judicial branch, the um, legislative branch, whichever way you prefer to say it. So the executive being the prime minister, cabinet ministers, and so on, or um, you know the first minister to, for Scotland, the first minister and deputy first minister in Northern Ireland, and so forth, they have the power to give orders, uh, like an executive, like a business executive, to execute it. Doesn't mean kill someone, consequent upon um, the judicial proceedings. Execute can mean to do it. Um, so like, like even the calculate button on, on, on calculate, uh, the, the button on a calculator sometimes says execute, as in do the calculation. Um, whereas legislatures, they pass legislation, and indeed they control budgets, whereas the judiciary, they adjudicate on the lawfulness of what's been done. Uh, they uh, uh, hand out punishments and so forth. So um, there's the rule of law, okay, this goes back century, that uh, no one is above the law, and that includes the monarch. That was clearly established by Magna Carta. It was reiterated with the trial of Charles I and so forth. Um, so there are constraints on what uh, people can do and they can be called to, to account for what they do. Or even the monarchy is in the gift of parliament that was uh, laid down by the act of settlement. Someone can be, they can change the line of succession as they did about 10 years ago. There's no longer primogenitor for the, sorry, there's no longer male preference for the monarchy. The eldest, uh, eldest child of a monarch, regardless of sex, would be the next monarch. So then there's also um, uh, sovereignty, which is a rightful power. But uh, it would mean that uh, a sovereign state, such as the United Kingdom, has the right to control everything within that state. Although the trouble is this is subject to some restrictions because of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, um, having said that, that's only because the United Kingdom has chosen to sign it. Now, a sovereign state is entitled to uphold its own sovereignty and to defend its territorial integrity and doesn't have to let any group of people within that break away if they wish to break away. Um, what else is I going to say about sovereignty? Yeah. Um, and then the, the monarch, she's sometimes known as the sovereign because she's this living symbol of a country's independence. 
that our country is really independent. Was the United Kingdom independent was part of the European Union? It's debatable. The UK is not part of the European Union any longer, but is still abiding by many of its regulations for reasons of, of trade. What's going to transpire after December 2020, we don't know, because the long-term trade arrangements have not yet been agreed. So um, let's look at uh, the we'll look at the applications of these things, human rights, as in that's the, the right to life. So you can't be killed without an overwhelmingly good reason. There, is, there are situations when the armed forces or the police could kill someone uh, if, that, if that's a reasonable thing to do under the circumstances. If um, I've got a hostage here saying, I'm going to kill her in 10 seconds, a police mark marksman could shoot me dead. That would be a reasonable reaction to that situation, had to kill the bad guy to save the innocent person or the armed forces in a battle, yes, they can kill people. But, you know, the police have to use have to use lethal force as an absolute last resort. And they have to use le and in other situations, they can use lesser degrees of force, but it's got to be the minimum they need to control the situation. Um, they, they mustn't use it excessively. Um, or the right to security of property and person, as in, you know, habeas corpus shouldn't be imprisoned without good reason. If you are arrested at rest on suspicion of a crime, they, they mustn't hold you unduly long without charging you up to 24 hours, unless, of course, they arrest you under the terrorism Act, which they can hold you for up to 28 days without charging you, and that's contentious. Um, or you're, you're not, not to be tortured, your goods are not to be seized um, without um, a, a lawful process, uh, and things like that. There is judicial review that we have the right to legally challenge governmental decisions and to test their constitutionality. So um, this is all about public law, about um, how the state interacts uh, with the individual, or different public bodies interact with each other. Um, that can be something like a public library, it could be a public swimming pool, whoever administers these things. Um, and the various um, uh, administrations within the United Kingdom, the Northern Ireland um, Assembly and Executive, the, the Scottish Government as it is now, apparently in some legal documents it still has to be called the Scottish Executive, the um, Scottish Parliament, uh, the uh, uh, Westminster Parliament, that's obviously in London for the whole of the UK, um, the London Assembly, the Welsh Assembly, the Mayor of London, the Mayors of various cities and so forth, local authorities, these are like your county council, city council, so these are all public bodies. And um, But, but uh, some of these principles are applicable in private law too. So um, we had like Gina Miller using judicial review to try and challenge Brexit. We have challenges about building railway lines. Is that taking away people's rights too much? If there's compulsory purchase of land, is that proportionate? Is that um, um, an unwarrantable intrusion upon the rights of an individual? And they have to be paid a reasonable amount. What's that? Again, this could be a matter for the courts. Um, about things about the right to die. Um, sh sh is that permitted under, under the Human Rights Act? Uh, at the moment, assisted suicide is unlawful in the United Kingdom because there's a right to life even if you don't want to be alive. Um, committing suicide is no longer a crime. Until the 60s, attempting suicide was, was prosecuted. You obviously weren't prosecuted if you if you um, failed. Um, but, you know, helping your spouse go to the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland to commit suicide, you could be prosecuted for murder for that um, because uh, you're, you're helping them commit suicide even though it's going as taking place abroad. Even if, if your spouse is compus mentis, is suffering agony and is, is mentally sound, you know, the psych psychiatrists have validated this and signed all sorts of documents being recorded multiple times saying, I want to die, I know what I'm doing. Um, so public law is also about criminal law. Anyway, so we'll look a bit at the, the um, characteristics and nature of the UK Constitution and its, its sources and its numerous conventions. So um, uh, Professor Dicey is one of, was one of the leading authorities on this. Um, Albert Venn Dicey, it was Vinarian Professor of Public Law in Oxford University through much of the 19th century into the early 20th century. Uh, it's called Vinarian because Mr. Viner donated the money to create this professorship in the 18th century. So um, uh, Dicey, uh, he said, the rules which directly or indirectly affect the distribution and exercise of sovereign power in the state. He says that's what a constitution is all about. Um, anyway, he died in 1922, but we can still consider many of his pronouncements to be very pertinent. Um, so he was a controversial figure. He was an um, ardent conservative, he was an ardent unionist, he didn't believe there should be home rule for Ireland, for example. But um, even if you disagree with on this, that doesn't mean what he says is bunkum on other issues. Um, so uh, legal documents set out rules about the structure of the state. That's part of what a constitution is. It can said to be um, a statement of the um, core values of, of, of the state. Um, it should, could be a charter which uh, guarantees your rights. Um, 
the thing is, how, what status should a constitution have? It's not changeless and unchanging like the laws of Persians and Medes. They can be um, uh, amended, and the, the UK constitution has been updated on multiple occasions. So we wonder how formal must it be? Um, and the trouble about the conventions is they're just that. They're conventions, they're not laws. What if somebody departs from a convention which we never thought would happen? What will we do then? At the moment, it's a hypothetical question, but we could be faced with this. So, um, there's, because it's not codified, there's no constitutional court. Some countries, let's say Azerbaijan, Russia, uh, Moldova, they've all got special constitutional courts. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, the, in the UK, there's parliamentary sovereignty. And there's a famous book, The English Constitution by Walter Badgett, saying Parliament is omnipotent in all things except the power to abolish its own omnipotence. So um, Badgett, uh, um, he said the monarchy w was central to all this, the monarch has certain rights, the right to be informed and the right to warn and, and the right to advise the Prime Minister and, and, and others. Um, advising people not to let too, day too much daylight in on the magic in terms of, of the Constitution. Um, Okay, so there are dangers and there are safeguards to this constitution. The, the, the constitution is supposed to uphold our rights and provide for our security. So much of it relies on, on political custom, as I said, um, but the weakness is, is it's um, just so uncertain what it is. And could people not breach it? Well, would it really be a breach if we don't actually know what it is? I think it ought to be clarified. Right? That's just an expression of opinion. You might disagree with me. That's not a fact that it ought to be clarified. You might think it's completely satisfactory the way it is. So people criticise Teddy Blair as, as a constitutional vandal. Well, um, he got rid of certain things, like some hereditary peers. You might regard that as laudable, but he brought in other things, devolution in the United Kingdom, and that's, for, for good or ill, that is a lasting effect of the Blair years. So um, uh, democracy is now at the core of the UK Constitution. It didn't used to be. Till 1832, only 5% of men had the right to vote. Within a hundred years, virtually every man or woman had the right to vote. So constitutionalism is something that the UK is, well, not distinctive on, but it's been, been there in the United Kingdom for quite a long time, limits on, on the monarch's power. Uh, but that's now the norm everywhere, and most countries don't even have monarchs. So it, it changed incrementally, uh, so there were some informal changes. So how about the evolution of, of the UK constitution? Well, the United Kingdom as such has only existed since 1707. It's only existed in its current borders since 1921. So there was the instrument of government in, in, in 1653 by Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector. You might remember when Charles I was overthrown and executed, Cromwell started to rule, and um, he said, well, we've got to have some sort of document knowing what my powers are. We'll write the instrument of government. And indeed, the Swedish constitution is also called the instrument of government. But 1688, there was a revolution. Some call it the Glorious Revolution. And after that, there's been step-by-step -step change, perhaps a bit pragmatic, but 1688, was a, was a vintage year for constitutionalism. Well, that led to the Bill of Rights the following year, the Act of Settlement, um, which made it um, crystal clear that um, the monarchy is in the gift of Parliament. They can make and unmake monarchs, and they can alter that line of succession. Um, the Bill of Rights, all sorts of things like there's not to be a standing army without the consent of Parliament, because otherwise the, the monarchy could use that to bully Parliament to close it down, as Charles I attempted to do. Um, uh, gun rights, for example, except for Catholics, a lot of anti-Catholic discrimination back then. So um, it would now move towards this constitutional monarchy and democracy. Um, their, their prerogative power is still held by the monarch, but exercised on her behalf by the prime minister. But what if the monarch were going to say, no, that's just a convention. I am, I'm, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to declare war on Peru or something. I'm going to abolish the Royal Navy. Um, what would we do? We just don't know. We'd have to jump off that bridge when we come to it. So many people have said there ought to be reform. Lord Scarman was a celebrated judge of the 1980s. The Scarman reported to the Brixton riots, and he said, our constitutions are not unwritten, but hidden and difficult to find, barely known to the public, and the citizen lacks a constitution which can be read and, and understood, and which enables him, if need be, to claim a right he can enforce. Like, look at the United States Constitution, it's several thousand words, and you can find it all over the place. Um, it's written in crystalline prose, and so uh, school children learn chunks of it. Um, you see it um, inscribed, so the uh, prolificity of constitutional quotations in American life means that Americans are, are highly cognizant of their rights and willing to assert them. Um, okay, let's look at the, the United Kingdom, how it's reformed and how there's been some reaction against these. So in 1998, devolution, the Scotland Act, the Wales Act, the Northern Ireland Act and so on, or even setting up the London Assembly and a directly elected Mayor of London. As in the ordinary people of London, they elect a Mayor. 
Now, many towns and cities in the UK have mayors, but for the most part, people elect the councillors to the local council, and the councillors then elect a mayor from amongst themselves. Directly elected mayor is different. So, the Human Rights Act, which I already mentioned, 1998, the Constitutional Reform Act in 2005, which set up the UK Supreme Court in 2009 and made, made sure that the Lord Chancellor is now just a politician in the, in the cabinet, he's not a judge anymore. So there was also the Fixed Term Parliaments Act in 2011, saying um, uh, elections to be every five years, not more frequently, unless Parliament specifically votes for it by a majority of over two thirds. So um, anyway, 2015, there was, there was a election in accordance with that act, and uh, then, but then 2017 was an early election, and 2019 another early election. So we seems to have gone against the grain of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. So uh, let's look, because previously the Prime Minister would, would, would advise Her Britannic Majesty to dissolve Parliament and call an election, and he would do so, the Prime Minister would do so at a time which is advantageous to the governing party. You might say that's unfair, the Chancellor of the Exchequer could manipulate things to make sure the economy was looking rosy to give his party the best chances, chance of being re-elected. Um, but uh, you don't want to be too rigid because there might be a reason why you need a particularly early election, like to break the let Brexit logjam. OK, so look at um, sovereignty, how we can be concerned about this and how some people reacted to the pooling of sovereignty or the distribution of sovereignty. There was a referendum on continued membership of the European Union in June 2016. Um, and by 52%, people voted to leave. And finally, in um, January 2020, Brexit actually took place. Um, but the United Kingdom has since is only halfway out, still paying money into the European Union and still subject to many of its regulations. So how about the Human Rights Act? Will that be repealed or not? But a lot of that, that's obviously just putting the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law. But some of, some of what you'll find in the Convention has been part of UK law, or prior to that, English law, um, for decades or even centuries. Um, but some of it is relatively novel, like the right to set family life. What is that? Does that include same-sex couples or not? Nowadays it would. In 1948, definitely not. <laughs> Homosexual acts were illegal in almost every country. Um, so let's look at some of these sources of constitutional rules. It comes from legislation, it comes from case law. There's also the royal prerogative, which I mentioned, so a prerogative being both a right and a duty um, from, from the uh, law of the European community. And there are other things which are not legal. I'm um, not saying they're illegal, but they're not laws, conventions, and various um, uh, practices, how things usually work in academic opinion. So um, anyway, some of the sources, Magna Carta 1215, which I mentioned, the Bill of Rights, the Act of Settlement 1701, and that also um, underscored judicial independence. Judges can't be removed simply because they make a decision which the, uh, uh, the, the executive finds uncongenial. So there are some other vital statutes here. There's the Par Parliament's Act 1911, so removing the House of Lords' right to veto legislation and saying they can, they can delay it by two years. Parliament Act 1949 got it down to one year and also said the House of Lords has got no control over money bills. The Statute of Westminster 1931, which recognised the various dominions, back then it was Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Newfoundland, Newfoundland was part of Canada in 1949, that they're all um, independent and they're all just cooperate with the UK but they can do what they want. And obviously more and more countries became dominions like India and Pakistan and really all the rest of them, most of them declared republics and so they, they've just gone their own way. There's the European Communities Act, 1972, paving the way for the Europe, United Kingdom to join the European Economic Community on New Year's Day, 1973, and obviously the UK's out of that. That European Economic Community was usually called the Common Market, so the EEC then evolved into the European Union. Um, okay, so um, anyway, the, some of these things are constitutional statutes, um, Thoburn and Sunderland City Council, 2002, decided that. That was decided by the Lord Justice and his surname was Apposite Laws. Um, the Thoburn was this famous case about this bloke wanting to sell things in um, imperial measurements. Um, Avoir du poids, ounces, pounds, saying people can understand that my customers don't understand grams and kilograms. Because the European director said, no, you must use the metric system. A far easier system based on multiples of 10. Why do so many languages work on multiples of 10? 10 digits. Anyway, so back to common law. That's um, judge made and it reacts to events. Um, there was a celebrated case, Entick and Carrington. He said um, legal authority is needed for government power. The government is, is restricted in what it can do. Um, 
And uh, there was another important case about um, people at General Communications headquarters, as in sort of spying on f foreign phone calls and emails and everything, in 1985, when some people there wanted to f form a trades union, have the right to strike, but they were banned from doing so. I remember Tony Blair, a young Labour MP, said it was scandalous and undemocratic. These people weren't permitted a trades union and couldn't go on strike. So the Council for Civil Service Unions and Minister for Civil the Civil Service was a case about this. Um, so, uh, but anyway, the, the the court upheld the government's rule that they weren't allowed a trades union there because it was so vital to national security. But that proved you could have judicial review of the exercise of prerogative powers, and they found that the government had acted lawfully in forbidding these people from forming a trades union. Uh, generally speaking, the government wouldn't be allowed to do so. You can't do that with bin men or train drivers or whatever. So. The royal prerogative. What is this? Well, let's see what Dicey had to say about it. The residue of discretionary or arbitrary authority, which at any time is legally left in the hands of the crown. Okay, so that's the monarch, but really not her personally. Again, her just being a figurehead. Um, because remember, she appoints all these prime, all the mi prime minister, prime minister, prime minister, cabinet ministers, and all the rest of it, archbishops. That's another thing, the established church in England, and only in England, not the whole of the United Kingdom. So the, you know, uh, England being the only officially country, Christian country in the world besides the Vatican. Many countries have a Christian majority, but only England does the, does the, has a church with official status. Um, all right, coming on to EU law. So EU law is a source of law for the law of the United Kingdom, and indeed within that, England and Wales. So there's... Um, uh, uh, let me see, um, the Crown, Miller, and the Secretary of State for Brexit 2017, when um, uh, Gina Miller tried to challenge Brexit. So um, this this case f found, well, what we already know really, reiterated that their primary sources, such as treaties, and their secondary sources, such as re regulations and directives from the European Union, and there, there are rulings from the European Court of Justice, or these days we're encouraged to call it the Court of Justice of the, of, of the European Union, which is based in Luxembourg. Okay, Factor Tame being an important case in all this, that Spanish fishing vessel in, um, in the 1980s and the UK Parliament passed the Merchant Shipping Act, but that clashed with EU law and that case, the Factor Tame case, went on for several years, but the long and the short of it was that EU law takes precedent. If the two collide, European Union law prevails. And now, does that undermine parliamentary sovereignty? Arguably. On the other hand, this situation only pertains because Parliament agreed to be part of the European Economic Community, as it then was. So there are various non-legal sources to the, to the Constitution. I didn't say illegal, non-legal. There are conventions and there are um, ways of political behaviour. So Dicey said that these are conventions, understandings, habits or practices which, though they may regulate the conduct of officials, are not in reality laws at all since they are not enforced by the courts. Um, okay, so coming on to Sir Ivor Jennings, who was a, a um, uh, celebrated uh, academic uh, in the mid-20th century, um, he, uh, he asked about this. We have to ask what, what precedents there are to these conventions, and do the actors believe they are bound by a rule, not actors on the stage? Does the Prime Minister, does the, does the Sovereign believe they're not bound by a rule? It's questionable. Like, Prince Charles seems to have tested the boundaries of this. I know he's not the Sovereign, but he's due to be the next Sovereign. We seem to think the Queen is immortal, the Queen could die today. We're not necessarily going to get a long warning that she's ill for a year, get a time to get, get have a chance to get used to the idea she's about to die. She could go like that. Nobody aged 94 is that healthy. Um, so what if, if, if Prince Charles takes over? He's rather more independent-minded. He may not be so restricted in what he says and does. So what would we do then? Um, but the UK has coped with this before. George III mentally ill, and they didn't exactly depose him. They had a Regency Act, but presumably he had to sign that. Somehow got him to sign it, <laughs> and therefore his son exercised his powers on his behalf. Um, George IV, Prince Regent. So um, is there a constitutional reason for this rule? Jennings asked. And if there, are, if there isn't, we have to question whether it's a, 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 um, uh, a convention at all. So Jennings didn't have answers to these things himself. He simply posed the question. So, um, look, uh, the amendment to the Constitution of Canada in 1981, and that was the United Kingdom agreeing that, yes, Canada is absolutely sovereignly independent and we've got no control of what they do at all. Still a very amicable relationship between the two, but the last vestige of it being a colony was gone at that point. 
yes, the uh, Elizabeth II, she's the Queen of Canada, but nobody says that London is bossing Ottawa about any more than Ottawa controls what London does. Obviously, it being understood, if you name the capital city, that's a synecdoche for, for the whole country. That just means the government, really. So, um, some of these conventions, royal assent, the Queen agreeing to things, signing every single act, no matter how controversial, and then it being said in Parliament, la reine le veut, as in the Queen wants this, we will this thing in French still. At okay, Eric there are very, various parliamentary conventions, such as the Sewell Convention on Devolution, um, or votes on if going to war, military here, action in Syria, sure a vote on that, famous in 2013, Parliament voted against it. But then Theresa May, when she's Prime Minister, she bombed Syria without Parliament authorising her to do so. Was that legal? I've Thank not heard anyone say it was illegal. Um, but uh, was it an unwarrantable act of aggression? Again, you could argue that. But even if it wasn't aggression, does it have to be authorised by Parliament? That's not absolutely clear. Blair held a vote in 2003 before the liberation of Iraq. And, and he, he got his vote, but it, it was still very um, contentious, and no Prime Minister had ever done that before. You could say there was a greater democratic basis for military action against Iraq than there hadn't been in any uh, conflict before or since the United Kingdom was fought. So, um, uh, the picking of the Prime Minister and Ministers, this is an example of a convention, and until, until uh, let me see, the Fox North Coalition, um, the Prime Ministership there was completely in the gift of, of the monarch, as indeed was the composition of the cabinet, um, he, he would pick whoever he wanted and force them to work together. The Prime Minister couldn't submit a list as he does now when the Queen always, always says yes. Judicial impartiality, that's another convention. So why do we have these conventions at all? Well, what did Jennings say about it? The short explanation for the constitutional conventions is they provide the flesh which, uh, uh, which clothes the dry bones of law. All right. Well, a metaphor which is not easily understood. Conventions allow the, the Constitution to be fluid and to adapt to a rapidly changing situation. Jennings says it fills the gaps, but uh, we don't know what it is. I mean, fluid is very malleable, too malleable, perhaps. Um, so uh, we've evolved a curious constitutional setup. It really is sui generis, um, and it can modify the strict legal position. So there are certain downsides to the UK Constitution. Um, we're not sure what it is, and we don't know what happens if it's breached. So what if a convention is breached? Well, um, we somehow have to muddle through. Um, so uh, make it up as you go along. Um, the, the 1909 People's Budget was a bit of a logjam when uh, the House of Lords wouldn't pass this budget. House of Lords very conservative dominated. The House of Commons had a liberal majority um, and they didn't like extra taxes on the super rich, the Lords, because they were very wealthy. But that ended in the, the Parliament Act of 1911, which as I say, clipped the House of Lords' wings. So uh, law, if the two collide, law takes precedence over conventions, of course. There was a famous case about this, um, Madzim Bamuto and Lardner Burke in 1969. So the Attorney General and Jonathan Cape in 1976 established, I suppose what we already knew, there was collective um, uh, ministerial responsibility. They are all responsible for all areas. So you're, you're brief, you stick to that. You publicly defend government policy in public. Um, and uh, there was another one about reference ray amendment to the Constitution of Canada 1981, when, as I said, the UK recognised Canada's Canada absolute independence. So the UK Constitution, let's conclude, it's not codified, um, it is not um, written on, on, on tablets of stone, it evolves a lot, it's hard to find, as Lord Scarman said, and it has evolved um, very greatly uh, due to conventions, but... Um, these are perhaps less political um, than they used to be. So that is just a very brief introduction to the sources of the UK Constitution. Toodaloo.